So, thank you. So we are um, very close to Tisha B'Av in the nine days and our yearning and our study, therefore, of the Beta Migdash intensifies. What I want to share with you is the final halachas, the final laws of Hilchas Beis Abchirda, the laws of Hashem's, the laws of the construction of the, of the Beis Migdash. It's a section of the Rambam, Maimonides, and it is devoted to the details uh, of the construction, the size, and all of, all of the details that make up the Beis Migdash. So this is how we conclude, this is chapter 8, this is how we conclude the laws of the Holy Temple, the Beis Abchira, which means God's chosen house. It concludes with the discussion about the manner in which the Koyanim would inspect the perimeters, the courtyard of the Beis Migdash every morning. What would happen? During the week, on weekdays, before dawn, while it's still dark, they would rise, the Kohenim, it's a whole process, where they slept, how they were woken. So they would be woken and they would get up and they would walk through the entire courtyard, circling it, carrying two torches of fire. Actually, there were two groups. There were two groups and they set out in opposite directions and that met, then met, well, almost kind of halfway. And they carried these torches of fire And here's the final halacha. This was the procedure that was followed every night with the exception of Friday night. On that night, it's really, not, it's really Shabbos morning, not Friday night, but he calls it Friday night because it's still, it's still night. They did not hold torches in their hands. Instead, they inspected the courtyards, courtyard using the light of the torches, the lamps, that were left burning on the walls before the commencements of Shabbos. All right? So in simple summary, every morning, Sunday to Friday, the inspection holding lit torches. Not so on Shabbos. They used uh, the light that was already lit before Shabbos on the walls of the courtyard. So this has attracted the question posed by many commentaries, why would this be so? Why didn't they take the lit torches on Shabbos morning as well? Why should they have? Because there is no rabbinic law does not apply shvus, I'll soon define it, in the Beis HaMikdash. There's all kinds of rabbinic law. One, one category of rabbinic law is called shvus. Now this refers to those laws they enacted in order to put a fence around the Torah law and protect it. Don't even get close. We are familiar with many of these laws, particularly on Shabbos, which is the case at hand. We may not handle those objects which we may not use. Now, handling it, touching it, moving it from the Torah perspective is entirely permissible. You can handle matches or what have you, all kinds of objects on Shabbos, anything. Your phone as well, you can move it. You just can't, you can touch it. You just can't use it. But the sages forbade even touching it or moving it for the obvious reason, because that could easily lend to the actual transgression. So hence, it's true, the sages enacted the law that one should not move a lit, a candle, a lit torch for fear that one will extinguish it or come to strike a fire since he's handling it. But these laws do not apply in the Beis HaMikdash. Ein shvus b'mikdash. The simple reason is, these laws are designed in order to protect the observance of Torah law, which may be violated um, by mistake. If we allow you to go this far, you'll forget and just by habit end up transgressing. There's no forgetfulness in the temple. The Koyunim are very aware. They're in God's holy house. They're serving God. They're, they're very focused. So there's no need to put up fences to protect Torah law. 
So this is a very powerful question. Why is it that Maimonides rules that they did not do so on Shabbos morning? The fact is that all Shavuos, rabbinic protective laws, are suspended in the Holy Temple, and hence they should have walked around holding all their torches, like all other rabbinic laws suspended. That's basically this morning's question. Now, the Kesef Mishnah, the famous Abba Yosef Cairo, who later authored the Shulchan Aruch, the first code of Jewish law. So he presents, suggests the following resolution, the following answer. He says, look, in this particular case, um, the same end is achieved without carrying the lit torches. There are torches on the, that they would light before Shabbos stationed on the wall. So there was plenty of light. So there's no need. There's no need not to respect the rabbinic law. So we might as well respect it like we do everywhere else outside the Beis Hamikdash. Why? Because we can accomplish the same thing. The point is the inspection. It's lit up with the torches on the wall. No need to carry the torches. Therefore, in this case, they respected rabbinic law. Because the same result can be achieved by respecting it. So why not? I'm not losing any time or any, you know, it's the, the, the goal is achieved. So why not respect rabbinic law? That's the answer he suggests. But the Rebbe says we find this answer wanting. We have to look, we have to go deeper. We have to find another answer. What's the problem with this answer? Because we find that here's an, an illustration where even in a case where, where we can easily respect rabbinic law and get the same result, just as easily, we don't. We suspend rabbinic law as if it doesn't exist at all. There's no consideration for it. Unlike the Kasef Mishnah who says there is consideration in a case where you can achieve the same goal. What's the case where we can clearly see the Rebbe says, where there's absolutely no consideration for rabbinic law in the Beis HaMikdash, just the following scenario, Yom Kippur scenario. The Allah is, the, Allah is the, the Torah says that on Yom Kippur, the Koyan Godel immersed in the mikveh five times. We may not wash or bathe on Yom Kippur, but he was obligated every time he changed his clothes from the priestly, the high priest clothes, the, the eight vestments, the golden vestments, they're called the big days of, and he changed into the simple white linen clothing of the ordinary coin, which he used when he went into the Holy of Holies and other services. Each time he changed his clothes, which is five times, he immersed in the mikveh. Fine. There was a special mikveh located in the temple complex. There were several, but there's one specially reserved for him that was used on Yom Kippur. Actually, it was on the roof of a building. On the left or south side of the temple, of the temple courtyard. The, the, the south wall of the temple courtyard. So the law is, if the high priest, the Kohen Godel, was old, or he was infirm, he was ill, and the cold water would be injurious to his health, they would heat the water. How would they heat the water? So iron slabs were placed on the fire before Yom Kippur. They were white hot and they were thrown into the mikveh and on each occasion when necessary, and he immersed in a mikveh that was warm or at least tepid, not cold. Now that normally is forbidden on Shabbos. Let's to explain. One of the prohibitions that the Torah prohibits, not rabbinic law, Torah prohibits is completing the manufacture or production of any object. Now, if a person were to take iron slabs and put them in cold water to complete the iron slab, that would be a Torah prohibition. But from the Torah perspective, if you're putting the iron slab in the water, not because you want to complete the slab, but you want to heat the water, that's okay. They're not boiling the water, they're just making it warm. They're boiling, so that is okay. So in this case, this is a rabbinic law. This is a rabbinic prohibition normally outside the Beis HaMikdash. The, the sages would forbid such a thing. The, the sages forbid putting the iron slabs in the water, even if your intent is to warm the water because it looks too much like to the observer, number one. They don't know, maybe you're doing it to complete the iron slabs, but more to the point, the person himself. One week he did it to heat the water and somebody else, so he himself would do it to complete the iron slabs. And that would be a total prohibition. So that's an example of offense. Eshavuz. But it was completely disregarded in the base of Migdash. Disregarded, even though there were other solutions. What other solutions? Is pour out water. 
have hot pots of water boiling on the on the fire before Yom Kippur and then pour it in. And that's not even a rabbinic prohibition. Why didn't they take that route? So we see from here that Rebbe says that even we can achieve the same end in respect to rabbinic law, we don't. Back to our question. Why didn't they carry the torch this Shabbos morning? And another proof, by the way, interesting proof, where we can see clearly that we do not consider respecting rabbinic law in the base of Migdash, even if we could easily and achieve the same results just as easily. For example, again, the Yom Kippur example. In Kippur night, the Kohen Godel was not allowed to sleep for fear that he may incur impurity during the course of the night. That would disqualify him, would be a bad omen for the people. We didn't want that to happen. He spent all night studying, saying to heal him, studying, preparing himself for the arduous service that he performed all day in Yom Kippur. He did everything himself. So he would sit and learn, but he could easily doze. So there were the young kohanim, they're called the pirche kohana, the flowers of the priesthood, that they would like stand there. And if he was dozing, they would do this. Now, doing this on Shabbos actually is prohibited rabbinically, or Yom Kippur. Likewise, clapping hands, drumming, even dancing, because of the fear, you use instruments, instrument will break and you'll fix it. Now, just parenthetically, of course, you know, nowadays we do clap our hands and do dance on Shabbos and Yom Tov, and even Yom Kippur, we clap our hands. That's because nowadays instruments are not part of our, our daily life. We don't have musical instruments as a daily expression as they did then. And moreover, we can't fix them anyway. We wouldn't even try if it broke. So therefore, nowadays, while singing, serving, and just like this, you shouldn't. But if you're singing and digging and you're davening and you clap your hands and snap your fingers and dance, it's okay. But then not. Then it was rabbinic law in force. So the question is, the Kohen Godel is dozing. They could raise their voice. They could tap him on the shoulder. There are many ways they could wake him and respect rabbinic law. They don't have to snap the fingers. Since the rabbinic law at that time was on Shabbos, Yom Tov, Yom Kippur, there's no slapping, uh, uh, snapping fingers, clapping hands, anything that is rhythmic that is associated with any kind of instrument. And yet we see that it's just not a consideration. You can't, they should uh, snap their fingers. So what do we see? Another proof. This is all to, to uh, dismiss, as it were, the attempted answer of the Kesef Mishnah who wanted to answer, look, we can get the same result by respecting rabbinic law. Why not? You just heard two very powerful uh, illustrations where we could respect rabbinic law and it's just not considered. Not the story of the mikveh, not the story with the snapping of the fingers. So back, with, back to our question. Our question is then, so why Shabbos morning did they not take torches in their hands to inspect the Beis Migdash as they did every other day of the week? Very powerful question. The Rebbe shares with us a very powerful answer and we'll try in the few minutes that we have to convey it. As is most often, we answer questions by asking more questions. What's the additional question we're gonna ask now? So I told you that the law of the daily early pre-dawn inspection are the final halachas in Hilchas Beis Abchida in the law of the construction of Hashem's chosen house. And the question is, what are these laws doing here? This isn't about construction. This is about the daily service. There's an entirely other very thick section in the Rambam, which is the laws of the daily service in the Beis Amikdash. That's where it belongs. In fact, the very first law, how does the day begin? The daily inspection. If you look at the laws of Hilchas Beis Abchir, it's all about dimensions and size and, 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 and what was there and how it was made. It's all about construction, friends, about building the house, not about the service in the house. So why givald, givald, givald? That was three times. Why are the laws of the daily morning inspection 
recorded at the end of the laws of the construction. It belongs in the beginning of the laws of the service or at some point. Answer, aha, eureka moment, an epiphany. This compels us to, to reconsider this whole, the meaning of this whole inspection. It's not in the laws of the service, the avoda. It's in the laws of the construction. So what does it mean? It means this, friends. The inspection was not necessary in terms of function. Everything is in order. No one can, it's God's house, it's protected. It was a mark of respect and awe, reverence. Not a functional service, but an expression of reverence. And that's why the Rebbe says, here's a detail I didn't share with you before. I told you that there were two groups and they circled around uh, and then met almost halfway. Actually not, but anyway, they met. The net result is the whole peripheral, periphery had been, had been circled. When they met, this is what they would say to each other. Shalom, hakol shalom. Peace, all is peace. Peace, all is peace. They should have said, hakol beseda, everything's in order. They don't use that language because that wasn't the objective. They used a, a much more poetic language in their meeting each other. And in fact, God's name is called peace. And of course, peace evokes the messianic era, much greater, much greater uh, laden language than simply saying all is in order or everything is fine. I call shalom, all is peace. All is whole, all is perfect. Meaning again, this underscores what I'm sharing with you, that this was not a functional, this is why we're answering right now, you heard the answer, why this law does not appear in the laws of the service, the avoda, it's not part of the avoda. It's not a function, they're not serving, they're not accomplishing anything other than expressing their awe and reverence. Awe and reverence, that's, what, that's all it is. And therefore, it's a subtle answer, but very deep. When expressing their awe and reverence, so when it comes to doing an avoda work, get the job done, the law is, all rabbinic law is not considered, just do the job easiest, direct way that you can. And forget about all rabbinic laws and fences, you don't need them here. Just, just do what you have to do. When it comes to expressing love, awe and reverence, really awe and reverence, it's really a ceremonial walk around the temple, showing our love and how precious it is to us that we circle it each morning <clears throat> as a salute of respect and awe. In this case, we're going to do that respecting every nuance, even rabbinic law. It's not a service. So if there's a rabbinic law that says, wherever, generally on Shabbos and Yom Tov, you don't carry a torch, you won't do it here either. We'll respect every nuance, every formality. Every ritual and formality that's associated with, with on Shabbos, at, on Shabbos, we will respect when we make this ceremonial circle of the temple, because it isn't about a function. It's about a mark of respect and therefore formalities, every formality, every safeguard, every distance. What's a safeguard? To step back a little bit. The safeguard, the sages step us back. When we're expressing our formality, we step back a bit. We don't sort of hands on direct, get the job done as easily as you need to do it. It's don't get any job done. It's actually step back and be in awe. And if we're stepping back and being in awe, then we will incorporate it, the rabbinic fences and whatever else is relevant. I hope my point was clear. Perhaps it'll be clearer when I illustrate it in the following way. What I'm going to tell you now doesn't say, that I didn't say this, but I'm suggesting that this may be a, uh, a lesson to be learned. Friends, the base of Mikdash is our home. In fact, the whole purpose is to make our home a base of Mikdash. In the bigger picture, it's to make the whole world a base of Mikdash. A home for God. So here's the thing about your home. At home, 
with our spouses, our children, because we are at home and familiar. We don't conduct ourselves with the protocol and the and the the formality that we do with strangers outside our home. And, and that's how it should be. The salutations, the language, the the etiquette, the step back a little bit, the formality doesn't apply at home. You're familiar, it's your home. That's it should be. That's how it should be. Where we talk to each other, um, where we interact, there's a a, a casualness about it that, and being familiar, that ought to be. It's your spouse and your children. However, that's in terms of the everyday interaction. But then we need to step back, and Shabbos is the time to do this, and be, and be in awe. Wow, I have a home. Spouse, children, this is awesome. This is a gift from God that is beyond me. And we step back. We step back. That's what happened every morning in the in the in the in, in the base of Migdosh, and particularly on Shabbos. On Shabbos, on Shabbos, they respected the formalities and the etiquette that apply to non-Shabbos because this isn't the moment of interaction. This is the moment of, wow, there's a house, there's a home. There's ceremonial uh, inspection was a mark of amazement, a new, a fresh awe and wonder every single morning. And therefore, when it came to Shabbos morning, we did so with the same formality and protocol. And if there's a rabbinic law that says, you know, step back a bit, don't just grab that torch and run around. Of course, that's the nature of this whole inspection. It's awe and wonder, it's formal. What I'm saying is there is some, something formal, if you like, about our relationship, not to be taken for granted, and that is the very gift. Do we step back and not familiar? And Friday night, the Ishishchayel or the Kiddush, that's the time, because this whole story is a Shabbos story, that is the time to appreciate the gift of our families and that you do for a moment by stepping back and just be in humble awe of it. Hence, hope we're clear, when they made that ceremonial uh, inspection each morning, it was an expression of awe and therefore even on Shabbos it was, they respected the rabbinic law that says step back. They did it with all of the formality that could possibly apply, even if they didn't have to, didn't have to. But of course they would, because this is part of the temple. And that's why these laws appear at the end of the construction of the temple. Because if you don't have an awe for the temple, you've got a beautiful building, you got a house, you have people living in it. But if you're not in awe of it, and there isn't this sense of humility and wonder then it's not a holy temple. It's not the Beit HaMikdash, it's not a home. It's a house, it's a common roof. So the Rambam concludes, he concludes the end of the laws of the construction of the Beit HaMikdash with this incredible message about all. A certain hands off as we consider this gift that we have. And then we engage, then we engage. And that's every Shabbos. And that's the final law. Because it's the law of the construction of the temple because that's what makes it the holy temple. It's precisely this demonstration of reverence and respect and a love rooted in that reverence and respect. Friends, sorry, I need to run now. The plane's not gonna wait for me. And it shouldn't. So, be well, everybody, and I, I'm back, God willing, before Shabbos, for sure, hopefully before before Shabbos, and uh, look out for all of the messages you, know, messages you receive from us about Shabbos and the protocol, Tisha B'Av, this year. Hopefully, all the protocol is suspended. Mashiach comes, and it'll be a new protocol of celebration and singing and dancing. That's what we hope, but we'll do what we have to do in readiness and, and uh, 
and uh, hopefulness that it's all going to be turned around. So stay tuned and be well, everybody. Good to see you all. Sorry that I'm kind of leaving abruptly, but got to go. Be well. Bye. Safe travels, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Bye.